Hi everybody. In this video we're going to be looking at the 4 f3 and 4 bishop e3 variations of the check peers. So just to recap how we get to this main position after e4, d6, d4, knight f6, knight c3, c6, this is the um, beginning of the check variation. So as I was saying we're going to be playing in this video f3 and bishop e3 variations. And so, right off the bat, why have I bundled them together? In short, it's because typically the player that plays one wants to play the other in the next move, and they've just chosen some order um, to start with um, one of them. You'll see that this setup with these two moves, queen d2, queenside castle, is very popular at all levels. It's um, what in the Sicilian would be considered the English attack, and it's just especially against these setups by black that are more flexible. It's um, really easy to obtain, and it's solid. In the middle game, they can throw their pawns at you for some sort of kingside attack. It's uh, just a really simple idea-oriented system that has a lot of bite if you're not careful with black, especially if you castle kingside. So it's this is why you'll see this um, played. Against both moves, f3 and bishop e3, I actually have the same recommendation, which is queen b6. It's a little bit surprising because uh, the positions are actually very different, but it, it turns out that queen b6, although being a sideline of a sideline, in a sense, is uh, very viable and actually, I think, poses, I guess you could say, immediate questions to white because they're not going to be able to obtain their desired setup with f3, bishop e3, queen d2. And if this is all that they know about um, playing against, let's say, non-committal systems like this, they're going to have a, a tough time thinking on their own. So it has psychological edge as well as just being objectively fine for black. So let's start with f3 because it's the most common um, between the two. And queen b6. So the idea is pretty straightforward. White would have liked to have played bishop to e3, but now the queen eyes the b2 pawn, so... And it's not just a bluff. Bishop to e3 is uh, actually just jettisoning the uh, pawn. We just take it. Uh, knight has to guard the knight. And the move I'm recommending is just queen a3. The strategy that we adapted from this point forward is just one of consolidation, where we can see that you know white does have... Uh, space advantage, extra development, but the way that they've organized the pieces doesn't really uh, help them take advantage of it. They would like to play e5, but in that event we can just play like knight d5. And in a second here we're going to play knight to d7, and that will just rule out e5 indefinitely. This is... I, I just want to make the point here that it's not something that you have to know Lots of variations about. I think just the ideas that I can present in one example line will make this a um, good enough for you to just start playing against people who sacrifice their pawn in general. Queen d2 makes sense. Knight to d7, rolling out e5 for the immediate future. Whenever you see rook to b1, where your queen might start to come under fire, you can bring the queen back. Here, a logical move is knight to g3 because we have to develop our, our bishop. And then we can just play solidly with g6. Bishop's coming to g7. Our queen will come back, and then we'll play for c5. And this is the kind of consolidation that we want to prove that we have an extra pawn. And white has compensation while they have more space, but I think once we... Um, just turtle up here and get ready to fight back, then we'll just be asking them, all right, prove it. Prove that you have compensation, because it doesn't look like you have anything to me. I wouldn't be worried at all about facing this variation. Um, the computer agrees that white's compensation is minimal, and the moment that we start you know, either exchanging things or fighting back for central control, uh, the evaluation changes um, from little bit better for white to equal, and then black is just up a pawn. So don't be afraid of fighting against bishop e3. I do think that 
can be classified as a bit of a dubious move. Bishop c4 is actually the main uh, variation that you'll be seeing. At least it seems most popular according to my database, and it makes the most sense. Here, your bishop is out of the way before we play knight to e2, and we have this additional idea of bringing the bishop back to b3 to indirectly defend the uh, b2 pawn so that we can develop our bishop. And I think this is a really good move against um, when black plays e5. However, uh, we don't have to play e5 and let white get their ideal setup where they play bishop e3, queen d2, queen side castle, and chuck their pawns at us. Now that the bishop's in c4, why not just play e6? And now d5 is more enticing than ever because it comes with tempo. After knight g to e2, d5, bishop to b3, e7, bishop b3. We're following a game here between two very strong players, white being over 2600 and black being just about 2500. Uh, when we when I first saw this game, actually I was quite confused here after Black's next move. I spent uh, more than a few moments trying to figure out what it was that was uh, that White was threatening against our queen with this bishop e3 move, and then I kind of had to do a face palm after I realized that they just want to play b5, a5, and White's bishop is very uncomfortable here on b3. Not only is it completely blocked out by this pawn chain, it's becoming a target for queenside expansion, and just to show this game as kind of an example of how um, this might work, already black is able to push again on the king side, and showing that whites, all of white's pieces have just been um, completely disharmonized with the setup, with the e6 on d5, c6 setup, rather than on um, e7 being played to e5. So I'll show this game as an example of play. We can throw in h5, force the knight back, and the only moment we have to really um, take here is just to play a g6 to prevent any f5, and then already we have what I consider a very nice French a position. c5 is fighting against the d4 pawn, and black just has easy development. I'm going to flip through a bit more of this game because there's a nice tactic uh, that, it, that happened in a few moves here. It kind of just serves as a benchmark for how to play against the bishop c4 move in general. Since these ideas um, are kind of applicable to any um, kind of setup that white had adopted on the king side, and the moves that white played were very logical, so it's likely to be to be common. He takes c5, bishop takes c5. Just coming back and defending the f6 square. I just have some arrows showing that that the queen side play is a bit more, let's say, um, natural for black. And our king is quite safe here in the center, especially since the f6 square is covered. So I wouldn't be um, too afraid of anything. After these moves, uh, this is a blunder. So pause the video if you want to take a moment here to figure out why exactly this move is no good. And otherwise, I'm just going to jump right into it and give the answer. So. Uh, maybe you got a hint from the fact that I had my mouse on the knight. You can just take that. Boom. Bishop b2. Exclam. It's a fork, and white can't take it because they'd hang the d pawn. So in the game, white had to play um, queen d2. And it's not just because we're winning a pawn. I could also just, just in case you can't see with these uh, nice blue colors here on the squares, the king and rook are being forked. So. That's not viable. And from this position, this was a pretty easy conversion by black. I mean, these pawns can't even advance. So, very nice game by black. A good benchmark. As I said, I want to flip back. We don't need to do the whole game. But I think that that's a good reference point for um, playing this variation against bishop c4. Try to flip back a bit faster. Alright, so. Instead of bishop c4, what else could they play? Get rid of that. Why not knight to e2? Well, knight to e2 still encourages us to go into French-like positions. Let me get rid of that for the second. I'll explain that one. Because in these positions where they might play for e5 and f4, the knight really does belong on f3, especially since the bishop is not yet developed. Um, the knight on e2 is going to be a bit of a hindrance. 
So why is a4 um, the main move I have here? Well, white doesn't have a good way to develop. Unless they want to bring their bishop out to, to g2. Let me show what that would look like after, let's say, g3. You can just play bishop e7, d5, and just c5. Already this is a nice French position. Um, you don't have to worry about f5. I think just castling is is perfectly acceptable there. And also, white isn't in time to play c3 to defend against this pawn. Um, f5, they don't really have time, especially if they want to try to castle to have their rook support the f5 advance, then their king will get lined up on this diagonal. It's um, not very comfortable for white. So I wouldn't be too afraid of that. And the other option is, well, if we want to develop our bishop, we can uh, defend our pawn, or we can kind of like actively um, push the queen back. So a4, a5 is a nice idea. However, it's not no, super strong. Let's say bishop g5 is the best move. Um, why is a4, a5 not super strong? Because they can't continue with their normal plan with bishop e3. Bishop g5 is because they want to trade bishops. Here, um, whoops, our pawn is a little overextended after some continuation. Again, we get this really nice French. f5 isn't possible for the moment because the knight is pinned. Uh, and if it becomes possible, we always have g6. Knight to c6 will take a5 at our convenience. Um, this is a really good position. If instead, uh, bishop g5, well, first we can question the bishop. It should be seven. Let's do that kind of swap. Notice how then I would much rather be on f3, but um, was already played to e2 before we even went into this variation, so they never had that opportunity. Oh, can bring their bishop out this way, but then we have c5, and they again aren't in time for c3. And this is similar to the other variations. It's a uh, good French, even though the bishop isn't yet developed. Because we can make this exchange on uh, d4, when we uh, move our knights out, this knight will come to c5, potentially to e4, if the bishop isn't covering the square, and if the knight is uh, misplaced. When the bishop comes to the d7 square after knight c5, we can bring our rooks to the open file, and um, I think have a very good position working against this pawn. Um, we can expand on the queen side as well, fight against on the pawns here. This is a, a very decent position. That should be pretty easy to play. Full flip back through. Already you can see that these positions are much more structure and idea oriented than specific variations. So that's one of the big takeaways from these positions. I'll just cover one more move. A3 is a bit of a tricky move because um, white is going to be defending this pawn uh, indirectly. It's actually uh, a bit of a trap. Just to show what that looks like, you can't take on b2 because of the very nice knight a4, and I've highlighted all these squares that you'd like to retreat to and can't. So that would be, uh, I think only one player would be happy here, and it wouldn't be us. So after e6, bishop e3, you can just play bishop e7. Notice that we don't have to play d5 because the um, White can't play d5 themselves, the bishop on e3 would hang. And this is going to be an important point. Um, in these variations, the bishop can come to d3. Uh, and while the bishop can do that, we want to hold off on playing into the French structure when they might have an attack that is a lot more uh, viable with f4 and uh, f5, with the bishop supporting the f5 push. d3, castle. Knight to e2, knight d7. Notice that we've hold, held back on playing d5, uh, waiting to see what white does. In the event that white castles, um, we, they no longer have any fear, or we no longer have any fear of the g4 push. We can actually just go into a Sicilian type position where our knight can come to e5. It's This is already considered equal by the computer, and it's just not. Um, as critical as some other lines where white didn't waste a move with f3 already. Here we have all the typical Sicilian ideas. We can play a6, 
or queen back to c7, play for b5, bishop b7, or knight can come to e5, trade for the bishop. So it's not, um, especially with this trade of the bishop, it's not uh, super critical, as you might think, with the position with f4 and the the bishops looking at the king side. I think I'd be very happy to play um, these kinds of positions with black. And just um, in this moment here, notice that we've we've held back on any sort of central push until we see what white's doing. If they play queen d2, then probably c5 is still a good move here. And maybe d5 is a bit more possible. I think just c5 uh, still. And d5, if you're willing to get a little, um, a little pressed here, you can play for c5 in that way. And that's basically all you need to know about these variations. Um, pretty much against everything, you're going to play um, e6 and d5, with the exception that when white um, is able to get their bishop to d3, uh, then you should probably go for the Sicilian setups where um, you fight against this d4 pawn that has been cut off. The communication between the uh, queen and the pawn has been cut off, so there's more pressure on the pawn, and the bishop on d3 is more suited to playing for the uh, f4, f5. That basically covers everything you need to know about the f3 first move. So what about bishop e3? Well, still queen b6. It's nice because it comes with tempo, and it has a completely separate idea of go going for this uh, knight g4 move, which is uh, very uncomfortable for white, as we'll see. Probably the most... Um, Let's say the strongest move is a3. Again, do not take on b2 and lose your queen. That would be uh, no fun for you. I instead think that you should play knight g4. And you can see that we have this idea of playing e5, where white will not be able to resolve the tension in the center uh, favorably because Whoops, we're hanging checkmate. So, in fact, the best move here, according to the computer, is bishop to c1. And you can tell that this is already going to be a very hard psychological choice for any any opponent to make. Um, because it really feels like, what, what have I done here? I played this funny a3 move. And it doesn't even matter if it was a3 or even like rook b1. It, uh, knight g4 is my recommendation against all these moves. Um, because then we get e5 in, so white's already not able to get um, the positions that they wanted, um, because f3 can be met by uh, e takes on d, uh, e takes d4. And let's just give an example variation here of knight a4, queen a5, bishop d2, queen d8, takes b5, and we get the, we get the piece back, and White's structure is a little messed up in a way that ours will not be. So White will not get their um, ideal setup with f3 and bishop b3 at all. And and that's if they play what the computer's top recommendation is. If they play bishop g5, we can actually just get a very nice structure with h6, bishop h4, g5, bishop g3, bishop g7, knight f3 because we were now attacking the d4 pawn. And here in this moment, we can just play knight f6, we're bringing our knight back to attack the bishop. It was an nice time to do this, our knight had accomplished what it needed to on g4, and here white's best move is probably to play h3 anyways, to preserve the bishop, so we're not really losing time by taking this moment to bring it back to f6. If instead they were to play something like bishop e2, well, we can just go trade for the bishop and, you know, continue the game from there. After h3, play knight d7 because we intend to play e5 after knight h, um, knight h5. Play e5. Knight comes into f4. X takes. This is a um, very nice position for black. It's dynamically equal, according to the computer. So it says equal, but I think all the trumps that I can see exist for black. We have two bishops in a position that can become open. We have nice pawns here on the king side. Um, to push for a later attack, and we have the open line against the center. So 
White's compensation really only seems to come from the fact that they have a bit more center space and you know potentially they have an open line against their king but even that's not so dangerous because the moment our rook is on e8 um, you'll notice it's just like the fiend keto setups uh, the queen can't checkmate the king by by herself the king can just step over to f8 so i think nothing really to be worried about there i would definitely love to um, have this position in a tournament game where it seems like all the possibilities um, exist for um, for black in terms of changing the position. Even here, probably white has to play a passive move like knight to e2 just to defend um, the pawn on d4. So, And this is the variation you're going to get from pretty much any way that white proceeds because just after, like, let's say, rook b1, even b3, you have an additional option of playing for queen a5, but you don't even need to go into any complications. Because white, white will defend after queen d2, uh, queen to d2. But let's say just knight g4, it's the same thing. Either the bishop comes back and you play e5. Um, and let's just show what that would look like with. I think the one I showed that before, I had them play f3. But for e5, let's say if knight f3, knight d7, we have. What seems like a kind of an improved Philidor, improved by a tempo where white has to play h3 if they want to transpose into the Philidor. And they've played this move a3, which is not typical. They want a4. Um, just to recap the plans of these kinds of positions, we play bishop e7, we castle, we can play from then rook e8, um, bishop to f8. It's just kind of like a slow maneuvering. If we can get in b5, we would love to do so. We can even take on d4 and play on the open file, bring our knight to c5. These are the ideas behind the Philidor, and this is um, a nice position because we have the extra tempo. So, would not be afraid of that. And that's pretty much everything you need to know against any other way of defending b2. You play the exact same line. And it looks the same except for maybe the rook is on b1 instead of the pawn being on a3. So that's all the uh, the knowledge you need to know from uh, the get-go to start playing this in your own games. If a lot of these structures are maybe unfamiliar to you, I'd recommend um, testing them out, playing some practice games with a friend or a computer, playing some blitz games online. Um, just make yourself feel a little more comfortable, but do not be afraid to um, just uh, whip it out in a tournament game. I think your opponent will be a lot more uncomfortable uh, than you will. You, uh, you would be surprised. Uh, it's never fun to play against a line that you've never seen before, especially when it's um, completely viable. So hope you learned something, and uh, make sure you watch the other videos to see some of the more critical lines against the, um, the check peer setups.